Welcome wherever you are watching from. I want to invite you to open your Bible to the Gospel according to John, chapter 8. The Gospel according to John in chapter 8 as we continue this series. We left off as Jesus declared himself the I Am. He declared that they would one day come to know and believe that he is the Son of Man, even if it is on the other side of judgment, they would admit, as the Bible declares, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To some of them, that would be a word of judgment, that in spite of great, a great body of evidence and demonstration of miracle and a fulfillment of the law and the prophets, they had rejected him. But the Bible says, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So it is to them that Jesus begins to speak in verse 31 of John chapter 8 when he says this. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Very important point that, to understand that Jesus makes here about what a real believer is. It says that many had come to believe in him or had said or acknowledged that they believed the declarations that he was making, as many people in the world do. A lot of people say if you present to them Jesus, if you present the gospel, if you present the power of God from the word of God, they will acknowledge it intellectually. They will say, yes, I believe those things. But whether or not they are truly transformed from the heart level, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, whether they have truly repented, been transformed by the renewing of their minds, surrendered their sinful will, and been made a new creation, that is, there is more evidence that, that shows that than just a confession. Many people, they make a confession, and, and it doesn't mean that in a confession people aren't truly believers or truly aren't saved. That doesn't necessarily mean that. But a lot of people have made confessions, have signed cards, and declared that they believed in Jesus when, in fact, they did not have a saving faith. A true salvation produces a fruit beyond just a confession, Jesus explains what that is very clearly. He said, if to those who it says, to those who had believed in him or had claimed to believe in him, we believe in you, Jesus. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. He does not say that if you continue in my word, you will truly become disciples of mine. That isn't what makes you a disciple. That isn't what makes you a believer or saves your soul. We know from the word of God that faith and faith alone in Jesus alone redeems the sinful soul. But rather what he is saying, if you do that, that will be the proof. That will be the evidence. He says, then you will truly be my disciples. That will show that what you have now claimed is real. So that produces a question. Right? Well, what does it mean to continue in his word? Because that is a question we must ask ourselves. If we claim that we are believers in Jesus, we have to ask ourselves, well, do we continue in his word? Because Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119, about the middle of your Bible. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, close it and open it in the middle and you'll be close. Psalm 119, 11. Let's look at a few things. Is this everything the Bible says about what it means to continue in his word that I'm going to tell you right now? No, it isn't. But there are some themes that we can find in the scripture that will guide us in the right direction. Uh, if we are wondering, man, am I a, a true disciple? Do I continue in his word? Do I show the fruit of walking in his word as a real believer? Uh, there are some things we can find in the Bible as to what that means. Psalm 119.11, it's David said, Your word, the word of God, I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Verse 15, he said, he goes on, I will meditate on your precepts. Those are found in the word of God. And regard your ways shown to us in his word. Verse 16, I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget 
your word. What does it mean to continue in his word? Well, one thing that it means is we treasure his word. We value it. We pursue it. We, we know his word. He said, I, one translation of this scripture in verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. He has implanted, remembered the word of God. He says, I meditate on your precepts. I regard your ways. They matter to me. And I delight in your statutes. I want to know, David is saying, I want to know from your word what you want from me. And my heart's desire is to follow that path according to your word. And he said, I shall not forget your word. We treasure his word. If we are truly continuing in it, we treasure it. We have to know what it says and be in pursuit of it. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, I believe, it says, study uh, the word, of course, study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that is not, does not need to be ashamed, that can rightly divide the word of truth. We cannot rightly divide the word of truth if we don't know uh, the word of truth, if we don't treasure his word. There are things in our life that we, you know, many people, they claim to be believers, but they, they don't treasure his word, but we treasure other things. We, we value other things. We pursue other things. We meditate on other things, right? Our, our heart delights in many things. A lot of people, they delight in their own appearance, and that's what they meditate on. What do I look like? How do people perceive me? What do people think about me? We, a lot of people, they treasure that, people's opinion, people's view of their life, and, and their entire meditation, the things they think about, the thing that dominates their mind and the affections of their heart are the opinions of others and how they are perceived. We value material possessions, a lot of people, they value their clothes greatly and they think about it all the time and they shop to, to great ends to craft an image that they value of themselves. We value cars and boats and hobbies and pastimes and we think about it and we study those things. But the, the Bible says if you are truly his disciple, what's it say? You study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that can rightly divide this word. We should study and treasure his word if we are truly his disciples. That's one thing that it means to continue in his word, to treasure it, to love it, to value it. That means more than once a week. That means more than a half an hour. That means more than a person like me reading it and explaining it to you. Is this a part of it? Sure. But this is, a, this is what we're doing right now. This is just an encouragement. This is a challenge. This is a proclamation a declaration of what God has said and how we submit to it. This doesn't mean that people that just listen to this, they treasure his word. It'll be shown day to day, hour to hour, week after week, whether we really treasure his word, what we are by ourselves with his word. That's where, where we really treasure it or not. What else does it mean to continue in his word? He said, if you are truly my disciples, you will continue in my word. Second Timothy, far to the right, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. So to continue in his word, we have to treasure it. What do you treasure? What do you value? What is your heart and your mind constantly thinking about? What, what do you spend the most time turning your affections toward? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, what else does it say? It says, all scripture or the word of God is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. Watch this, for training in righteousness. If we are to continue in his word, then we are trained by his word. The Bible says in Acts chapter 17, it says the believers in the town of Berea, it says they searched the scriptures daily to see what was true to see if what they were being told was true, to see if these things are so, the Bible says. They were looking to be trained in and by his word. Uh, what's the Bible say? David said in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He desired uh, the word of God to train him where to go and what to do. It, it lit the way of his life. You know, I think about the word of God. What is it saying here? That we are trained in his word. We are trained in righteousness by the scripture. If we continue in his word, in a way that's saying the scripture is the lens through which we see, we view, and understand the world. 
There's so much to see in the world and to comprehend and to categorize in our minds. You see things on TV. You see the behavior of people. You see government and you see neighbors and you see people at your jobs and you hear stuff in the news and all of these things. And we think, man, what do I make of this? Uh, natural disasters and the weather and you know, cosmic information that comes to us through science. And we think, man, what does it all mean? The Word of God is a lens through which to view all of that and place it in proper context. And if we are not trained in the Word of God, then we are subject to any perception that comes in front of us. We see it through all kinds of distorted lenses that are offered to us in this society. I think about it like this. I think the other day I was with some people on their boat, and it was a sunny, hot day, and I had these sunglasses I bought from a gas station a couple weeks ago. That's where I get all of my sunglasses because what I'm about to tell you is inevitably always going to happen to me. So I don't buy expensive pairs of sunglasses. But uh, these happen to be, for $15 or so, polarized uh, sunglasses. So uh, you can put them on when you are out on a bright day or on the water, and it cuts the glare, right? I don't understand polarization, but uh, I I just know what it looks like when you look through those lenses. And you put them on, and and the clouds look different, right? If you take them off, it looks kind of blurry, and everything thing looks bright and kind of uh, uh, kind of foggy in a way, and you can't define clear lines. You put the polarized sunglasses on, oh, there's a clearly defined cloud, and the sky just got a little more blue, and you look in the water, and it cuts the glare off the water, and you can see the fish under the water. You take the glasses off, you can't really see the fishes clearly, if at all, because the sun is reflecting off the surface of the water. All of that. So I was hot on this boat, and I had my nice $15 polarized sunglasses on, and I stepped up on the side of the boat, And I didn't even think about it. I was so hot and sweaty, I just dove in the lake. And the minute I dove in, I felt the the, the rush of the water pull my sunglasses off. I wasn't even thinking about it. Ripped my sunglasses off, and I frantically reached, and I opened my eyes underwater, and I could see nothing. And I I swam down, and I looked, and I couldn't find it. And I came out of the water, and the world looked entirely different. The sun was bright. I'm like, ah! And they're like, oh, your sunglasses. I'm like, I know. And I went back down again. I couldn't find them. And I stood up on the back of the boat just looking in the water, and I couldn't see below the water. The the glare was reflecting in my eyes. The clouds looked all blurry, and I was squinting, and it was awful. And I think about the Word of God. If we don't have it, then how we see the world is an assault on our mind, on our senses. And people, they're looking through some lens. All of you right now are viewing the world. You are viewing your circumstances the burdens of your heart, the joy in your life, the needs for your future, all of these things you are seeing through a certain kind of lens of some kind. A lot of people, they see through the lens of their favorite politician. And so they will look and they will listen and they will say, this is how I view the world now. These are This person, this man, this woman's values are now my values. And I fight on this team and I believe these things about society and I want these changes to happen. And they, instead of the word of God, uh, they use a politician's talking points to view the world. And so they begin to adapt that understanding of the world. And it is an artificial one. It is a, it's a blinding glare of somebody else's fleshly desires. And we adapt that and we put that on like a lens through which to see everything. And and we view people differently depending on what that person says. Uh, A lot of people, they, they view it through you know, cable news, depending on which generation you are and how you receive information in the world. But a lot of people, they, they view the world through the lens of Fox News or CNN, which yeah, I'm going to hurt a bunch of people's feelings, are, are the opposite sides of the exact same coin. It's just a, it's a slant either way. And we put the lens on, we're like, yeah, these people agree with what my flesh wants the world to be. And, and they criticize the right people and they have, uh, you know, the, the, the right assessment of these things. And that's what I, I believe believe and that's what I want. Instead of the word of God, they see it through the news or social media and they, they look at people yelling at each other and they look at all these posts and all these you know informational things that go out and they're like, yeah, that, that's what I believe. And they share, share, share. And you become part of that lens. The Bible says that we are supposed to be uh, taught, reproved, corrected, and trained in righteousness by the scripture. We're supposed to be equipped by the scripture for every good work, the word of God says. Jesus said, if you are truly disciples of mine, then you don't continue through the lenses 
the artificial, blurry, fake lenses that Satan and the world system offers us, we put the true lens of the word of God on it, and you can see everything clearly, and the, and the closer we study it, the clearer the image becomes. And a true believer that continues in the word is trained by the word of God. We are trained how to think, how to see, and how to understand everything that's happening around us, and even in our own heart. Look at James chapter 1. What else? We're trying to look at some things that Jesus uh, was referring to here that the Word of God teaches us. Again, is it everything we can find? No, because the Word of God says much about the value of the Scripture to our Christian walk. But we can find some very clear things uh, defined in the Bible as to what it means to continue in His Word, which is part of the fruit of a real believer's life. They continue in the word of God. They don't continue in the things of the world. We treasure the word. We value it, and so we have a desire for it. We are trained by it. It shapes us, forms our perspective. It's a lens. James chapter 1, verse 22, what else? It says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself or herself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. It's like, oh, yeah, that's what I look like. And you go away and you say, hey, what color is your hair? What color is your eyes? And all these kind of things. You're like, you know what? It's, it's almost indicating that people treat the word of God like a cursory glance. Like you walk by a mirror real fast, you look and you're like, and, and you look real quick at yourself and you move on. And, and you know, someone says, did you notice what was happening to your hair? Did you notice what color shirt? Did you notice, you know, the thing on your face or whatever? And you, and you look and you're like, what? No. And you forgot what you saw because you looked so briefly and so matter of factly, you didn't take in the image. And it says, it's like a man. What is that like? It's a person who hears the word of God, but doesn't do anything that it says. They hear it, and they go away. They forget what they heard. It has no effect on their life. What does it mean to continue in his word? To live it. To live it. To not, and, and living it does not mean just hearing it. And it doesn't even mean just knowing it. It means doing it. And it says that if we are a hearer that does not do what the word of God says, we, are, we delude ourselves. We are delusional. We are self-deluded into what? What are we deluded about? The fact that we are truly his disciple. If we just sit in here and never do, we have no fruit that stands as a reason to believe that we have truly believed and been changed and are a real follower of Jesus. He says, if you are truly disciples of mine, you will continue in my word. So they say, man, as many people do, man, Jesus, we believe in you. And it's almost like he's saying, well, we'll see. We'll see. A lot of people say, I have believed in Jesus. When did you believe in Jesus? Well, I prayed. I signed this card. I went to this thing. I came forward at an invitation. I raised my hand. And look, I can't judge your soul. That's between you and the Holy Spirit of the living God. But the word of God can serve like an x-ray machine to a so-called believer's life. And it can begin to show you, was this evident in your life? And so they say, I believe you, as a lot of people do. And Jesus says, Okay, we'll, we'll see, because if that's the case, then you'll continue in my word. And one thing it means to continue in his word is to live it. Uh, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, it says, The one who says, and this is a lot, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him or her. Is a liar. A lot of people say that. Hey, man, you know Jesus? Yeah, I, I have come to know him. It says the one who says that it doesn't keep his commandments, doesn't do and is not being what the word of God says, says is a liar. Who do they lie to you first? Themselves. There, it said, James says you're delusional. You first tell the lie to yourself that you say, well, I have come to know him. And he says, man, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to everybody else. And the truth is not in you. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. A lot of people, man, you might say like what James is saying here, they, they talk it, but they never walk it. Um, this is, uh, 
I think this describes people who, who believe that being a Christian means sitting in church, means, means sitting and hearing the word of God and singing songs and being in a Bible study. Are, the, are those things bad? Are they condemned in any way? No. Those things aren't bad in and of themselves, but a lot of people use those things to trick themselves. Trick themselves to believing that they're a Christian. Like, so they go and they study what the Bible says, but they never do what the Bible says to do. James says, man, you're, you're deluded. First John says, you're lying to yourself. I think about years ago, I, you know, I, you've heard me talk before, I trained to be a, a single engine pilot. And uh, when I was in college, and it was, it was great, you know, I took this aviation training and everything, and uh, it started out in book work. And, and, you know, I went in the airport one day, I met a flight instructor, just, I just, I just, I was a walk-in, I just walked in, there's a cool guy standing there, can I help you? I said, well, hey, man, do you, you guys teach people how to fly planes here? And he said, yeah, and I said, uh, well, who does that? And he said, well, uh, I do it, if you'd like to talk to me, I'm a, I'm a flight instructor. I said, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, where do we start? And he said, well, uh, you got to kind of purchase a couple of these books and, and we'll start meeting and talking and then we'll start studying what an airplane is and how it works and uh, pretty soon we'll go up for a ride and uh, I'll begin to instruct you live in the plane. We'll start doing it. And I'm like, oh, cool. Where's this book? And so he's like, well, here's the book you need. And uh, he said, I'll tell you what, I'd like you to read these chapters and we have a lot of classroom time over the next several months. We have classes on this night at this time and uh, there's a teacher there, and you got to take a little sample test at the end of every couple weeks, or so, so you know, and so forth. And I'm like, oh, cool. And so I did it. I started reading the book, and I, I was interested in what it said. And I'm like, okay. <clears throat> when you're in the plane, it would say you do this and that. If you ever get in this situation, you do that. And if uh, you know when it's on the runway, you want to make sure of this, and you got to check these gauges, and this gauge means that, and this gauge means that, and you pull the yoke, and you do this, you trim tab. It had all these things. I'm like, okay, and I'm thinking, I'm trying to understand it. I wanted to understand it. Now, what a waste that would have been if I would have studied all that and known everything about it. Could walk up to a plane and you say, what's that? This is the propeller. This is the engine. You know, th this is you know, this is the tail. This is all these things, and I could have described everything, but never did it. Say, oh, man, you know a lot. Have you ever flown one? No, man. And that's what a lot of Christians are, I think. They, they, they put in the classroom time, and that's good, maybe, until we only do that and we believe that's what being a Christian is, and we never do it. They put the classroom time in, as you are doing right now, as they do in, 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 in homes and in living rooms and Bible studies and Sunday school classes and these kind of things. What are we doing? We're putting in the classroom time. We're putting in the book work. We're gaining the knowledge. We're hearing the word. But what a waste if we never do anything instead. We go out and you say, man, we, we've learned what it is to be a Christ follower to be his witness, to walk in righteousness, to experience the power of the Holy Spirit to be on his mission, walking closely to him and trusting in his miraculous wonders to open doors of miraculous opportunity for us to see his glory. What, what a waste if we just study, we say, man, what does it mean? And we could say it. And who is God? And we could show it. And what does the Bible say? And we could turn to it, but we never did it. We put the book work in, but we never went up in the airplane. That's a lot of people, man. And they like to sit and talk to people just like themselves. But we never continue in his word when we never live it. What is he talking about, Jesus? Continue in my word. We treasure it. You, you could say it. You love it. If you are truly his disciple, you love his word. You look at it and you stand in awe of it. We are trained by it. How do I see the world? What does the Bible say about this thing in my life? And we live it. We, 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 we plant it. We hide it in our heart so we can walk out in the world and there's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. John chapter 8. So he says that. And in verse 32, if you do that, again, that doesn't save you that shows that you are really saved. In verse 32, he says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they answered him, he says, that will make you, it will free you. 
man, you get, he says to those Jews who had believed in him, and if you are that, and that's real, then you're going to know what's true. You'll be able to separate truth from the lie, and it, and, and it will, make, it will f- set you free. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? See, that's a, that's a lot of uh, unbelievers in the world. They're just like that. They don't believe they need to be set free of anything. They're like, I, I don't have any problems. What do I need this for? My life is good. I'm, I'm healthy. I have plenty of money. My kids are healthy. Got a nice house. Got a good future. Got a good job. I'm secure financially. And you present it, you know, like, man, you are, you are a condemned sinner in need of saving. You violated the righteous standard of a holy God. If you were to breathe your last breath, it's a ticking time bomb. Every time you take a breath, it's like a ticking clock that will condemn your wretched soul to hell. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm a good person. I don't, I, how is it that you say you will become free? I don't need to be free. I'm not enslaved to anything. I don't need to be set free. I'm already free. And that's what they thought. That's what a lot of people think. Jesus answered them, said, truly, truly, that's an urgent plea. We see it in John's gospel all that. Truly, truly, he's like, listen to me. I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And they couldn't see it because they were hard-hearted and had blinded themselves, even though they said, man, we believe in Jesus now. We, we think he's telling the truth. A lot of people say that, but not to the point where it redeems their soul. They just intellectually acknowledge it, but they harden their heart to let it change them. They don't repent of anything. And it was them that he was talking about, and he couldn't, they, they couldn't see it. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. He said, they say, we're not a slave. Why do you say we need to be set free? He said, because you are a slave of sin. You, you are owned by your sinful desires. You are imprisoned by sin. Verse 35, he says, the slave, he uses this analogy here, and he says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. And he's speaking to his own authority that they continue to reject. He said, so if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And he says that it doesn't ma- he's about to tell them and explain to them, it doesn't matter. They say, we are Abraham's descendants. It doesn't matter what family you come from. It doesn't matter what religious knowledge you have if you haven't let it change you and repented to it. So it doesn't, I don't care that you're Abraham's descendants. He's saying, I'm the only one. The son is the only one that has authority to truly set you free. And they are owned by sin. Sin is their taskmaster, their slave master. And he says, if you are truly disciples of mine, you'll continue in my word and you'll know the truth and you will be free. A true disciple is free, free indeed. Free from what? They are free from the slavery of sin, the the power of Satan that once gripped and owned their life, controlled their mind, imprisoned their thoughts. You are free from the judgment to come. The Bible says the wages, the price for sin is death. But we are free. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we are free from the sentence of hell that every sinner deserves. We are free if we are truly his disciples. Romans chapter 6. Be a little bit to the right, Romans chapter 6, verse 16. The Bible goes on with this idea of being set free from the slavery of sin. In verse 16 it says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? And I would ask you right now, what do you obey? The desires of of your flesh or the will of God? Do you obey the approval of man or the approval of God? What do you labor more for? Do you obey your insecurities? Do you obey those dark thoughts? Do you obey that depression? Do you obey that discouragement? Or do you obey and, and are, you a, are you owned by the encouraging power of the Holy Spirit having set you free from the bondage of sin and death? says, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. There is no in-between. There's no middle ground. Verse 17, but thanks be to God 
that though you were, he's talking, he's assuming a believer, that though you were, past tense, slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart. See, these people in John 8, they're not obedient from the heart. They're obedient from the mind. They're like, oh, I think he's making a lot of sense here. And I see the points that he's connecting, and I can't refute the case that he is making, and I see the miracles that he's performed. I ascend intellectually to the facts of what he is saying. But they are not obedient from the heart. They protect their heart in the hardness of sin and the desires for the things of the world. They were not obedient from the heart. They simply had an empty acknowledgement, an empty confession, And it says, but thanks be to God that though a real believer, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Watch. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. That's what we should be. We should be enslaved to righteousness as a real believer. Verse 19, he said, I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. He said, I'm painting an earthly picture so you'll understand it. He said, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity. See, those of us that are really saved, we'll look back and we'll say, man, I used to present myself to sin, to impurity. I used to think impurely. I used to walk in impurity. I used to do all these things. And to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness. But he says, if you're a believer, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification or being made holy. We are to, uh, if we are truly free, then we are enslaved to righteousness and we ought to present ourselves to righteousness, as slaves to righteousness. What does that mean? Uh, well, it means a lot of things, but I'll, I'll just share with you some things right now. Um, it says in the Bible um, that we, we are, we've already talked about the Word of God, right? So one of the things to uh, present ourselves, to present our bodies, our minds, our spirit to righteousness, then we would uh, present ourselves to the influence of the Word of God. We would be in the Word of God. If we are truly saved, then we are slaves to righteousness, then we present ourselves to the righteous standard found in His Word. We present ourselves to prayer. Uh, the Bible says in a bunch of different uh, passages in the Bible, but a few are pray without ceasing. You know, if we are truly free and we know the truth and we are continuing in his word, we, it says pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean you're in a closet you know, with your head bowed all the time, but you have a, a culture, you have an attitude, a mindset of prayer all the time. You don't turn first to the answers that the world offers that are no answers at all. You turn first to God for your need, for your praise, for your gratitude, for your crisis. We pray without ceasing. You hear about somebody going through something in their life, what do you turn to? Do you turn to the world's wisdom and some empty poetic thing we see on social media? Do we turn to God and we pray for them? It says, pray at all times in the Spirit. Pray for one another. Uh, James would say the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. You know, for a lot of people, you know, it says pray without ceasing, but a lot of people live their whole life without praying. And, and at the same time, they, they say they're a Christian and God be the judge. So how do we present ourselves to righteousness? Prayer and also uh, in fellowship with one another. You know, anyone that's presenting ourselves to righteousness, we would be in fellowship with other brothers and sisters in the Lord regularly. Uh, the Bible says... Uh, iron sharp is iron, sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You know, many times, because of being in fellowship with a brother in the Lord, uh, something will be called out in my life. It will sharpen me to walk closer to Jesus. It, it will cut off old habits. It will cut off worldly affections. And someone will say, hey, man, uh, I, I just wanted to... I hope I'm coming in the right heart. I hope, I hope you believe that I'm coming in compassion and humility and I'm not coming from a high place as though I'm any better than you. But uh, man, I saw this in you the other day and, and I just want to challenge you. Doesn't the word of God speak better for us as believers? And man, if I have the humility of heart, I, I, many times I'll be convicted. I'll be convicted and that sharpens me. Like man, a true brother, a true sister in the Lord coming to me. Well, that doesn't happen if you're isolated from fellowship when you only hang out with the world and you're only about the things of the world. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 10, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. That's bigger than Sunday morning. That's, that's not talking about a church building like this one. We, we, can, we can come to church and still not be assembling with anybody in a real way. 
not being challenged, not being sharpened, not, not really being an actual fellowship. That happens in living rooms, man. That happens in restaurants. That happens over coffee and meals and working and doing life together and allowing people a place in our life and in our heart and knowing them and being known. We are to be in fellowship because the Bible says Satan is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. How does a lion work? Who, who does a lion look to devour? The one that is separated from the flock. And many people, it says uh, in Hebrews 10, are, that is their habit to separate and cut themselves off. We present ourselves to righteousness in serving the Lord, man, in our service. A real believer serves God because he wants to. God, Jesus is his king and his Lord, his savior. And we serve. The Bible says, uh, therefore, my beloved brethren, be always abounding in the work of the Lord. And people, they're, they're happy to abound in the work of their job because they get paid money. They're happy to ab abound in the work of the maintenance of their home and property, of uh, you know, the chores to keep up the material things that they have in their life. They're happy to abound in the work of their bodily fitness so they can look the way they want to look. They're, people can do work, man. You just work on the things and for the things that you love and that you want to. If we really love the Lord, we'll work and we'll serve the Lord. If we don't, we'll just phone it in and we'll learn the book work and we'll work for things in the world and we'll never serve him. We present ourselves to righteousness and our witness our witness to the lost. The Bible says, uh, You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. The Bible says in the Gospel of Mark, Preach the gospel to all creation. The Bible says in Romans, How will they hear without a preacher? We are called to be witnesses. And if we continue in his word and we are truly free, then we want others to be free. And we have a burden for the lost. And we lift up our eyes as believers and we see the fields white unto harvest. And we want to go out there and be a light. And somebody will say, man, that's for you, but I'm, I'm no preacher. That's not true. That's not true. People preach for the things they love. Everybody's a preacher about something. They preach for the things they're most passionate about. Boy, I bet if you had a diet that worked for you, or if you were selling something, you'd become a fiery preacher. You'd become an evangelist like nobody's ever seen, trying to recruit every family, every friend, every neighbor. You'd annoy every person in your office. They'd run and hide under desks and cubicles to avoid you because here you come to pitch them again. Like we, we, we are evangelists and preachers for the things that we have a passion for. And that reveals a lot, man. If, if, some, if somebody loves that golf course, man, you, hey, have you ever played this golf course before? No, nah, man, no. Nah. Oh, man, you got to try it. You got to try it. When, when can you go? I'll, I'll, I'll pay for you. When can you go? I want you to see this course. I want you to play with us, guys. Yeah, you you got to come. You got to play this course. You're, you're preaching, man. Everybody's preaching for something. You ever been to this restaurant? No, man, I heard it's really great, but I heard it's really expensive. Uh, again, I, I'll pay for you. You got to come. You got to try it. Oh, man, they got a steak there. You wouldn't believe it, man. They, they cooked the rock to 750 degrees. Oh, man. And you know everything about a restaurant you've never been to because somebody preached. People pre You see that show on Netflix? No, I didn't catch it. Oh, man. Oh, here, write it down. Write it down. All right. I want you to watch this show. We, my wife and I, we watched this show the other day. Everybody's preaching. If you love the Lord, and they say, man, I, I'm not really a preacher. I'm not really a witness. Well, that I believe, but it's not because you can't. It's because we don't have the passion in our soul to do it. It's because what, we, we don't even realize what we've been set free from. If we did, we'd preach louder for that to people than we preach for something on Netflix. But we preach, man. We are witnesses for something. We are evangelists for something. Jesus comes along and he says, hey, got some believers in the house, huh? Oh, yeah, we believe in you. Really? Well, if that's the case, you will continue in my word. You'll treasure it. You'll be trained by it. You will live it. And you will, you will know the truth and it will set you free. And you will, being free of the slavery of sin, you'll be slaves to righteousness and you will present yourself to righteousness. How? The word of God will be a part of your life. Prayer will be real. Fellowship will be authentic. You will look for opportunity to serve. You, know, you won't have to be begged and guilted. You will look, man, how can I help? And you don't do it for a pastor or a church or your own self-righteousness. You do it because you knew that you were a slave of sin, condemned under the law, but you have believed in the Lord and there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you think, man, Lord, I'm so glad 
For what you've done for me, I want to serve you with the rest of my life in some way or another. And man, I want to be a witness. I want to be a preacher, whether that's to one person in a neighborhood or a school or a job somewhere. But I want people to be set free. I have a burden. I see the fields, and I want to be a laborer in it. You say, man, I don't have any of those things. Well, I'd invite you to ask yourself a couple questions. And i got to be honest, I... It makes me ask questions of myself. It's okay. It's okay that we can admit that. So wherever you are right now, I just want to invite you just to take a moment. What David say? He meditated on his statutes and his precepts. He treasured that word in his heart. The word of God has gone forth. Let's take a moment. Let, let, let's, let's meditate on his precepts. I just want to ask you if you in a living room or hotel room or by yourself or listening in a car or something. If you can, depending on where you are and what you're doing, if you can and you feel comfortable about it, maybe just, maybe just bow your head. Maybe just shut your eyes to remove distractions, not because there's magic power in it, but just to, to bring a focus to your spirit. Somebody out there, you might say, man, I, I've heard all this and I thought I was a believer and I have even said I'm a believer, and to be honest with you, I'm still not sure. You say, but man, some of these things I'm seeing that examine the heart of a true believer that talk about the fruit of righteousness confronts me, and I don't know if I really know the Lord. All right. Why don't you bow your head right now and settle it with Jesus then? Because the Bible says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Maybe God is calling you, showing you, hey man, you've acknowledged the facts. You've acknowledged the truth. You've even confessed things to be true. But you've never really surrendered your sinful will and, and, and been regenerated by the Holy Spirit because if that were true, you'd continue in his word and these things would be present. And if that's you and you say, man, I don't know if I know the Lord, just bow your head right now. And tune me out and settle it with Jesus. Somebody out there, you say, no, I... I know the Lord and I used to have more of those things present in my life and I've drifted and I'm convicted. I'm not here to beat you up or discourage you. The Bible does say, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Man, people have sharpened me. I've been grateful for it. I'm praying God would use me like that in somebody's life right now. Say, man, I'm cut. Because the truth is, if I'm being honest, you say, I, I don't really continue in his word. I, maybe I used to more, but I don't anymore. It's, I pursue the things of the world more than the things of God. I don't really pray like I did. I don't serve like I did. I make excuses for myself. I, I'm not really in fellowship with anybody. I'm more concerned about the world and business and all these things. I, and I've lost my burden for the loss, and I'm not a witness to anybody, but I am an evangelist for things in this life that benefit me. Man, I hope God's challenging and talking to somebody. You say, what do I do? You just bow your head and take it to the Lord. If he's truly saved you, you've already believed it. He's nailed your sin to the cross and set you free a long time ago. Maybe just ask him to realign your heart with things eternal. What's Colossians say? Set our minds on things above, not on things on earth. I'll tell you what, man, as a real Christian, I, I have at times set my mind back on things on earth and say, man, I'm looking through the wrong lens or whatever it may be. God's talking to you and convicting you and calling you to a greater level of following him. Just respond to him. Just surrender to the pull of the Holy Spirit, wherever you are.
alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested in my Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested, my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom You faithfully bore He canceled my debt And he called me his friend When death was arrested My life began Oh, oh your grace So Darkness rejoices though heaven had lost.